Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. We continue our study in Acts chapter 15, a very important chapter. It sets the stage for all future church councils, and we find a number of them in early church history. But as we look at this particular council in Acts chapter 15, it's very important because it establishes the ground rules, the principles upon which all of the Christian life is to be based. It establishes the principles of grace. It establishes the principles of faith. It tells us that we are neither saved nor sanctified by the works of the Mosaic law or by human good works which are inserted by man. Instead, our salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, the Christ of scriptures. But it also deals with the issues of how to keep from causing weaker brothers to stumble and how to keep from marring our testimony to a watching world. Because as we live before the world, they have certain expectations of us, whether those are realistic or not, whether those are biblical or not. Nonetheless, we do not want to put stumbling blocks in front of people when we are either witnessing to them or trying to help them grow spiritually. And that's what we find here in the latter half of Acts chapter 7. We were looking at avoiding stumbling blocks last week in verses 19 through 21. I'm going to start reading a little bit in uh, verse 15 and following. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we move from this portion of text into the next, we pray that you will guide and direct us in a way that is truly edifying so that we might be believers who stand for what is right and at the same time deal gently with those who are young in the faith and deal judiciously with those who do not yet know Christ. We pray, Father, for your blessings upon this your word as it goes forth tonight, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now that last verse is a very important verse, and you know that I spent a good deal of time on that last week, verse 18. So at the risk of beating a dead horse, I would like to repeat just a few of the things that we covered because I think it is extremely important for all of us to understand the biblical definition of foreknowledge. The Arminian view says that God looked down the corridors of time and saw who would believe and thus elected and predestinated men based on the choices that men would make. Thus the Arminian view believes that foreknowledge is limited to what God simply foresaw that would, in fact, irrevocably happen. On the other hand, the Bible teaches us that God, as the infinite first cause of all things, not only knew what would happen, because nothing would have happened if God had not acted first, but that God knew all the possibilities of things that ever could happen, depending upon how he chose to act first. For example, suppose you decide that you're going to do some gardening and you have a choice of planting watermelon, corn, green beans, or carrots. So suppose you choose to plant corn and carrots. Now because you have made a first choice, you know that what you'll get is a crop of corn and carrots. You will not get a crop of watermelon and green beans. Nothing forced you to plant the corn and the carrots. You made a specific choice that gave a specific crop. So certainly we can admit that God has more sovereignty in his choices than we have. And since God made choices before he created anything, he made some specific choices so that ultimately he would receive the greatest amount of glory. 
The biblical view that gives a cor correct perspective of God is that nothing would have happened at all unless God had acted first. You know, it's rather interesting to me, as you know, I'm a creation versus evolution fanatic, and um, the evolutionist way of thinking really lines up with the Arminian view that stuff just made itself and that things just happen. But the Bible teaches that there are an infinite number of possibilities depending on how and what God created. For example, God could have chosen not to create Lucifer in his unfallen state. God could have chosen not to create the angelic beings that followed Lucifer. Suppose he'd chosen to make Lucifer but not to make any of that other third of the angels that fell. So there'd only be one rebel in the universe, Lucifer himself. God could have eliminated the possibility of having a tempter in the Garden of Eden by simply not creating Satan or by barring him from the Garden. God was under no obligation to create anything. And he was certainly not under any obligation to create a spirit being who would sin and become Satan. God is not obligated to any creature. God could have chosen, as we said before, to create Bork and Zog instead of Adam and Eve, but God didn't do that. God created Adam and Eve. He created them with precise responsibilities. He created them with precise abilities. He placed them in a garden that was invaded by a creature that he had already made. He knew precisely what would happen because he chose to create precise, morally accountable creatures who would respond to their external environment in precisely a certain way just like fish respond to their environment of water and land animals respond to air. Neither can long survive in the environment provided for the other. It is because God sovereignly acted first without any external pressure and with full knowledge of all possible events that could happen depending on how he chose to act first that the precise chain of historical events fell into place as they have fallen into place. One of the things we did not talk about is biblical prophecy. Biblical prophecy is proof that God is in control of history. God didn't just look down the corridors of time and hope that something good was going to happen out of all the things that he saw bad happening. It happened because God ordained it, and that's why prophecy is so exactly precise, because God has foreordained certain events that ultimately will bring the greatest amount of glory to him, and he has told us in advance, in the scripture, what those events will be. It does not happen simply because accidents along the way forced God to somehow readjust his plans. Where the Arminian view departs from scripture is this, the Arminian view makes God subject to history rather than making history subject to God, and that's what verse 18 is talking about. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. It does not say known unto God are all man's works from the beginning of the world, although that's obviously a truism. But man can do nothing outside the sovereign will of God, even our good works, that is our works of faith, done in the power of the Holy Spirit, done to the glory of God, and done in obedience to the word of God, even our good works were predestined by God. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them, Ephesians 2.10. Even the decisions of greatest kings are controlled by the hand of God, and we looked at several illustrations with King Nebuchadnezzar, for example. The eternal plan of God is in control, but men are still had, held accountable, and that's the point, the sticking point, where Arminians don't like the idea, but God, God says so in the Bible. It tells us both things. We can't put it together in our mind, but we don't base our scripture knowledge and belief upon our reason. We based it upon revelation. And remember that. Remember that when reason, or your human reason, conflicts with the revelation that God has given, revelation should trump reason every time. And so we looked at the challenge to grace, the challenge to faith, and the stumbling blocks that were happening in the early church, and different stumbling blocks happen in the church today. And we noted that the main principle that we need to, all of us, pay attention to is that even if we have Christian liberty in certain areas, as more mature Christians, we need to learn to give up our rights to keep weaker brothers from stumbling. 
And that's the practical conclusion that comes out of the Council of Jerusalem. They've been dealing with a theological issue of law versus grace, faith versus works. But they have a practical conclusion because what you believe theologically determines how you act in the practical Christian life. If you believe certain things, you will act one way. For example, if you believe that the gift of tongues is still available, and that is what is required of a person to be saved or a person to manifest the showing of the Spirit, you are going to seek to speak in tongues. There's all kinds of false theology, and that's part of it. There's all kinds of false theology that motivates people to act in a certain way. Jehovah's Witnesses believe, here's their theology, that they must go out knocking door to door because that is buying them a ticket to the kingdom. And so that's why they do it. Dear people, if you really believe what scripture says, it will change the way in which you live. Oh, how I desire that all of us put the practical life with the theology that we believe. We have this massive amount of incredible true doctrine, but we keep it stored in our head rather than letting it change our lives. You know my questions that I always ask. So you say that you're saved. How has it changed your life? Because true doctrine, truly believed, will change your life. The Holy Spirit uses the Word of God to transform us day by day into the image of Jesus Christ. And those are the issues that in practical application the Council at Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15 is struggling with. If we really believe these things, that it's by grace through faith alone and not by works of the law, how is that supposed to change the way in which we relate to the world around us and the way in which we relate to other fellow believers who are weaker brothers in the faith? Don't have quite the knowledge yet that we have. Paul deals with that issue. We saw it in detail over in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 where he talks about the meat offered to idols. And he says, I know there's nothing wrong with the meat offered to idols. In fact, it's probably some pretty good cuts of meat. And uh, it doesn't have any idol cooties on it. Uh, it's a very good chop of meat. But if somebody who used to worship in the idol temple sees you as a Christian sitting there at meat, and he's trusted Christ as his Savior, but he's completely rejected all of that stuff from the past, but he sees you doing it, he's going to be tempted to go back and he's going to wound his weak conscience. And you've caused a weaker brother to stumble. And that's not a wise thing for you to do because that's somebody for whom Christ died. And you're causing him, because he violates his conscience, to sin. It's a neutral thing, but when it violates another man's conscience and causes him to sin, it is sin. Paul says so in Romans 14 also. We studied those two passages in detail, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Romans chapter 14. Very important for us to understand that if you think you're a mature Christian, part of being a mature Christian is being willing to give up your personal rights, things that you could do without violating your conscience, things that you could do without violating the Word of God, the adiaphorous things, the things that are neither moral nor immoral in and of themselves, things that you know you can do, but you choose to give them up because you don't want to have a bad testimony to the world and you don't want to cause a weaker brother to stumble. Within that context, there are things that we as adults can do, but should not do for the sake of children who are watching us and trying to put it together. Dear people, are you a mature Christian? If you are a mature Christian, part of that is willing to give up your rights. For example, I try to make it simple. You as an adult have the right to walk just as fast as you want. And I've often walked around the, the river down here, around that path, starting from our driveway and going all the way down here, down to the corner, all the way down across the bridge, around, down across the bridge, down there on whatever that road is down there, and then coming back, I think that's 130, coming all the way back is five mile walk. I try to walk it fast. There are a lot of people who can walk it faster than I can. They're a lot younger. There are a lot of people who can walk it, uh, run it too, and not just walk it. I can't do that anymore. 
five miles. You as an adult have the right to walk it as fast as you want and as fast as you can. But suppose you had a three-year-old child with you and you're responsible for the three-year-old child. You know it's, it's practical common sense that you are willing to give up your right to walk the entire distance because a three-year-old child can't. You know, practical common sense, that as an adult, you're willing to give up your right to not walk it as fast as you could walk it. That's what we're dealing with. Things that are neither moral nor immoral in and of themselves, that you would have the perfect right to do, except you have a testimony to the world and you have a responsibility to weaker brothers in the faith. And so the Jerusalem Council takes that issue of circumcision and how it relates to salvation, because remember on the mission field there were those guys who were teaching you had to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses to be saved. And so it came back to Jerusalem and in Jerusalem there were believing Jews who said, well it's not necessary for salvation but it's needful for them to be circumcised and to keep the law, that is the Gentiles. It's important for sanctification. And the council says no. But then they lay down these principles. And we'll talk about the four things that they lay down because that brings us into the more stuff that we want to talk about tonight, although I'm adding quite a bit at this point of what we have not yet talked about. It's grace, divine election, divine calling, and not proselytism and law keeping. After they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. And we talked about that as a quotation out of the book of Amos. It's interesting how well the leaders in the early church knew their Old Testament Bibles. We think of ourselves as really knowledgeable Christians. We've got all kinds of tools. We've even got computers that can look up verses for us where we don't have to do any legwork. We sit there and push a button and it pops up on the screen. And we think we're great. But we don't know the scriptures. Earlier generations of Christians loved the scriptures so much, they didn't have concordances. They didn't have all the, the help tools that we have. Vines, exhaustive dictionary of New Testament words and Old Testament words, multiple different concordances, all the systematic theologies that have been written. You and I have a, a vast, vast wealth, a plethora of all kinds of different things available to us that they didn't have, but they knew the scriptures. Our concern was Christians often do things that cause other Christians to stumble in their practical Christian life. And the four things that were listed here in the text that would cause someone to stumble from grace were that they abstain from, number one, pollutions of idols. And our text tonight will explain what that means. And from fornication. And number three, from things strangled. And number four, from blood. The first two of those, the pollutions of idols and fornication, were moral prohibitions that related to both Jews and Gentiles. The last two we saw last week were related to Gentiles avoiding practices that would cause Jews to stumble and hinder the spread of the gospel. The first two, those things that related to idols and fornication, were transdispensational principles. And that means a, a rule that God gave that extends over more than one dispensation. Moral standards related to fornication, for example, and sex and marriage trace all the way back to creation, not merely back to the law of Moses. The prohibition against idolatry we saw was found in every dispensation. That's the worship of anything other than the true God, including covetousness as a form of idolatry. We noted that Colossians 3.5 and Ephesians 5.5 5 tell us that covetousness is idolatry. Whether we like it or not, when you go through the store and you start having pipe dreams about this, that, and the other thing, and you start meditating on it about, boy, you really want to get that, and you want to get this, and you want to get that, and you go out and spend everything. I know a family where the husband in the family makes 200 
$280,000 a year. $280,000 a year. <laughs> Takes me more than 10 years to earn that much. And you know something? The wife spends every penny of it. No savings. Nothing to show at the end of the year. Folks, covetousness is idolatry. The covetous man, Paul says, is an idolater. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. But the second two prohibitions, as we noted, specifically relate to dietary laws. <laughs> that seems like an odd combination, doesn't it, for James, after we hear all the arguments from both sides. And Peter is the apostle to the Jews, but he's the one that brought the Gentiles in. He stands up, and James picks up on Peter's testimony and says, As Simeon has said unto us, that's Peter, and he begins to quote these various things that Peter has said. James is not putting the Gentiles back under the Jewish dietary laws. We need to get that straight because in Acts chapter 10, five chapters before this, five chapters before this, Peter's on the top of the house and God says to him, let down the sheep from heaven with all kinds of worms and all kinds of gooey looking creatures that Peter had never eaten, pigs and everything else in it. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter says, not so, Lord, and that happens three times. It's drawn back up into heaven. Peter understands the application of it, but God never uses false illustrations. And Cornelius' servant and soldier are at the door. And so Peter goes with them and brings the Gentiles into the body of Christ in Acts chapter 10. But why in the world does James list these last two things, things strangled and things uh, and restricted him from blood. That's eating blood, you know, that, that's part of the Jewish dietary law. It's because we need to be willing to give up our rights for the sake of weaker brothers and for the sake of our testimony to those who need to hear the gospel. That was so abhorrent to the Jews to whom they were trying to witness or Jews who had recently come out of Judaism into the grace of God that it would have caused them to stumble and that's explained in 1 Corinthians 8 and Romans chapter 14 that's far different from placing Gentile believers back under the law of Moses we looked at all the key passages related to stumbling blocks we noted that there's only one thing though it comes in two different forms there's only one thing that should be allowed as a stumbling block. Peter told us that they stumble at the written word. And there's the, that passage is dealing with reprobation. So yes, that is something you can't tone it down. If you give them the word of God, the written word of God, and they stumble at that, you can't tone it down just to make it more palatable for the people who are listening. Romans chapter 9 verses 31 through 33 tells us that some people stumble at the living word. That is, they stumble at Christ. So two different forms of the word, the written word and the living word. You can't tone it down. You can't tone down the message just so it'll make it more palatable for people. Romans 11 says that the Jews stumbled at the word and at Christ, both the written word and at the living word, so that God could open the door for the Gentiles, which is what we find in Acts 10, which is what is being discussed here in Acts chapter 15. And then 1 Corinthians 1, 22 and 23 says the cross of Christ is a stumbling block for the Jews. So it's back to the living word again. But then we saw multiple passages where other things should never be allowed as stumbling blocks. Romans 14, you should never force your vegetarianism or your carnivorous diet on other brothers or despise them for their choice of diet. And of course, here we are dealing with dietary laws just like we saw back there in Acts 15, which is our text. Paul's still dealing with the same issue. Romans 14, 21, especially in verse 13. 
Then in 1 John chapter 2, in general, if you love your brother, which is a mandate, <laughs> Jesus told us, love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. It's not only a mandate, but it is a visible proof. And, Paul, and John says in 1 John that it's one of the three visible proofs that prove your salvation. Three things are listed by 1 John that prove externally that we have true salvation. Love of the brethren, true doctrine concerning Christ, and the godly lifestyle. Some people can't outline 1 John. 1 John covers those three issues over and over and over again from different angles. That gives you the understanding of what 1 John is talking about. Three issues. So that we as Christians can demonstrate in a visible and open manner how we are truly saved by the grace of God, how it has changed our lives. 1 Corinthians 8, if you love your weaker brother, you'll voluntarily restrict your action to avoid eating meat offered to idols that if it would harm his conscience and tempt him back into a practice that he considered sinful. And again, that's in context of dietary laws, isn't it? Which is one of the two things that James deals with in Acts chapter 15. And then finally in Revelation 2.14, we saw the church at Pergamos. Those of you who've been coming on Wednesday evening, had the privilege of seeing that incredible video dealing with the church at Pergamos and going on site to where it was located. None of us have ever been there, but you got to see it firsthand. And here are the discussion of that passage in Revelation 2. That was where Satan's seat was located. And we saw that all three items mentioned in our text in Acts chapter 15 were dealt with and discussed in Revelation chapter 2. There was Balaam's covetousness. Covetousness, idolatry, stumbling block. There was fornication. There were things sacrificed to idols. <laughs> Folks, that's the letter to the churches, not merely to Pergamos. Hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Yes, they were seven historic places. Yes, they do represent seven different types of churches. Yes, they do represent those different churches there in Asia Minor, but they represent also how we are to be dealing with the culture that surrounds us. Brings us to verse 22. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren, which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Forasmuch as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, Ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. <laughs> the Council of Jerusalem puts its stamp of approval on the message that Paul and Barnabas were preaching. And they said, we're going to make sure that you know that they're not just bringing back and telling you, yes, that's what the council decided. We're sending chosen men from our own company who will confirm that what Paul has been teaching is, in fact, the truth. Men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent, therefore, Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. So they put it in writing, and they had two men who are articulate leaders in the church at Jerusalem go along and confirm what was in writing so that nobody would think that Paul had faked the letter. Here we have two men well known to the church in Jerusalem and apparently well known to the church in Antioch. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who also shall tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good, now listen to the order this is, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. 
Do you understand what he is saying? He is claiming divine revelation for the commands that he is sending. This is not just a group of funny old men gathered at Jerusalem making it up as they go along. They are dealing with issues that are troubling the church, but they are living during a period of time when new divine revelation is being given to the church. And it is confirmed not only by the apostles, it's confirmed by the elders, and it said also it was confirmed by the brethren. There was a unanimous voice at the end of James' decision in Acts chapter 15. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Now here he's going to explain what they meant by abstaining from pollution of idols. That ye abstain from meats offered to idols. Within the context of this discussion, you are to abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. A major problem, not so much among Orthodox Jews, but definitely a problem among Gentiles. Have you paid attention to what's going on in the United States of America? Something like 85% of young people don't make it to age 20 a virgin. That people is horrendous. And the statistics are not quite, but almost that bad in the church. These are still serious issues which in principle need to be preached and practiced in the body of Christ. From things strangled and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well. Fare ye well. Short letter. But it would be confirmed by mouth by two men who had listened to all the arguments on both sides. So that if somebody in Antioch wanted to raise one of the questions, they could say, let us explain to you that was raised at Jerusalem. And when the question was raised at Jerusalem, here's how the answer was given. And this is why we have come to these final conclusions. There are some very important moral things that you need to keep in mind. And it's not just thou shalt not commit adultery, it's don't commit fornication. Fornication is a far broader scope than adultery. Fornication covers all kinds of sexual immorality. It covers things like sodomy, for example, bestiality and other things, necrophilia. Things that are too disgusting even to talk about. All of which were part of the pagan society. Note the sentence of James. The pollution of idols is clarified with meat offered to idols, and Paul discussed that in 1 Corinthians 8. Now we have the church in Acts 15 once again certifying another very important principle, which is established by God in the Old Testament, which is a principle that required two or three witnesses to establish every word. And we've talked about it in particular in the past, about how it related to capital punishment. Nobody could be put to death unless there were two or three witnesses. And we saw illustrations, for example, about Naboth and how there were false witnesses that said that Naboth had cursed God and the king because Ahab wanted Naboth's vineyard. And because Naboth wouldn't sell it to him, Ahab went and pouted. And Jezebel said, why are you pouting? You're the king. You can control this situation. So men of Belial came and falsely accused him and there were two or three witnesses so they were technically keeping the law but it was a false witness and Naboth is stoned to death as a result of the false witness 
But the Old Testament had also said, if there's a false witness, you're going to do to them the same thing that would have been done for the one against whom they witnessed. And in this case, because Ahab and Jezebel were the motivating factors behind it, Elijah the Tishbite caught up with him as he was walking in the garden thinking, ah, I got it now, it's mine now. He told him that the dogs are going to lick the blood of the chariot, which they did when Ahab was killed in battle. And Jezebel, as Jehu rode into town, stuck her head out the window and said, what are you, in rebellion against the king? And two eunuchs showed up next to her, and he said, toss her out of the window. And they tossed her out, and the dogs ate her. And all that was left was the palms of her hand and her feet. God is serious about the business of witnesses. Numbers chapter 35, verse 30. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 and 7. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. All three of those passages lay down the law of two or three witnesses. Every word to be established at the mouth of two or three witnesses. We find that the people make a covenant with God and testify as witnesses to that covenant in Joshua 24, verse 22. They make a covenant with God that God alone will be their God. They choose whom they will serve. And they witness against themselves multiple witnesses. You know what? God held them to that covenant. God held them to that covenant all the way through the history of Israel. We see the law of the witnesses in Ruth. Beautiful book of Ruth. And we talked about that quite a bit in detail when we had Mother's Day Sunday and talked about the godly woman that Ruth was. But in chapter 4, verses 9 through 11, we see the law of witnesses at work. Where Boaz makes sure that they're in the gate when he calls the such an one, whose name we don't even know, over to either buy the piece of land, and if you do, you've got to take Ruth, or not buy the piece of land, for I'm next in line. And we find the procedure of the multiple witnesses of the elders and all the people who are sitting in the gates. We get to the book of Isaiah. We find that God himself has witnesses in the Old Testament. In fact, he appoints certain people witnesses. Turn with me, because this is a very interesting passage. These are the passages where the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, take their name from, and yet these passages themselves witness against the Jehovah's Witnesses. Let's turn first to Isaiah chapter 43. We find illustrations both in chapter 43 and also in chapter 44. Isaiah chapter 43, let's look, let's look down at verses 9 through 12. Let all the nations be gathered together, and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses, that they may be justified, or let them hear and say, It is truth. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord. That's all capitals. That's Jehovah. And beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved, and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Did you know that you are one of his witnesses? You are one of God's witnesses because of what God has done, and you know it. What do we find in Acts chapter 1, verse 8? Jesus speaking to the apostles. What does he tell them? Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. God always follows his own word. God has witnesses who witness to him. You remember when we were going through the Gospel of John, we found that there were eight different witnesses that God called to the stand concerning Jesus Christ. 
God always follows his word. Two or three is enough. God always gives us multiple witnesses. And by the way, back to the Jehovah's Witnesses in this passage, you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen the Jehovah's Witnesses, saith that's us. That you know, may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. The Jehovah's Witnesses say that Jesus was created. They say that he's a created God. God says, I don't know about anybody who was formed before me or after me. I am the Lord. Beside me there is no Savior. The New Testament tells us who is the Savior. It tells us that Jesus is Savior. Unto you is born this day in Bethlehem a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now unto the only wise God, our Savior, says Jude 24 and 25. Be glory and majesty, dominion and power now and ever. The New Testament presents Jesus as the Savior, but Jehovah says, beside me there is no Savior. These verses speak against them. I have declared and have saved and have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. And the Jehovah's Witnesses do not point to the God of the Old Testament or to the God of the New Testament. Look over at chapter 44. I'll start reading in verse 6, though our verse is a little bit farther down. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. Now, we've done some extensive studies on the Lord of hosts. And we see that it is the pre-incarnate Christ, Yahweh Sabaoth, Jehovah of armies. That's Jesus in Revelation chapter 19, leading the armies of heaven back to earth as they come back to destroy the Antichrist. I am the first and I am the last and beside me there is no God. Book of Revelation presents whom as the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. I am the first and I am the last and beside me there is no God. Jehovah's Witnesses have got it all wrong. And who, as I, shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. And that gets us back to known unto God or all, the, or all of his works from the beginning of the world. Now, verse 8 and 9. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity, and their delectable things shall not profit. And they are their own witnesses. They see not nor know that they may be ashamed. Witnesses. God calls witnesses to the stand on his own behalf. You are witnesses that I am the true and living God, says God. And the one speaking, who is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, is none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We find that Jesus reinstated that principle over in the Gospel of Matthew. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 18. You're all familiar with this passage in Matthew chapter 18. Starting in verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more. So here's you, you're number one. If you take one more, you've got two witnesses. If you take two more, you've got three witnesses. Take with you one or two more that in the mouth, and here we are quoting Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 15, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Now, I want to stop and make a point here. We don't have quite this strict um, of rule in modern courts of law, but under divine law, every word had to be established. Do you realize that's why it took them so long to find witnesses against Jesus? Because a lot of people came to witness against him. And they had a really difficult time because they couldn't get every word. That's what the Old Testament law required. That in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word's got to be established. But finally they found two, two false witnesses uh, who both agreed 
with a very short phrase that Jesus said he was going to destroy the temple and raise it again in three days. And they said, wow, at last we got two guys. And then even that is kind of flaky, you know. I mean, in two or three days, destroy the temple. I mean, like, everybody would realize no guy could do this. How could he do this? One guy comes in here, destroy the whole temple? Come on. I mean, they didn't have bombs like we have today. They didn't have, you know, weapons of mass destruction. They didn't have missiles to shoot in from outer space. One guy's going to come in there and knock down blocks of stone that are as big as a whole section of pews here? It's not going to happen. So they asked him, what is it that these witness against thee? They wanted him to say something so that they could all hear it and they wouldn't have to repeat it because every one of them would have to say, well, he just said this and if one of them got it wrong, then you can't blame him. And that's why at the end, Caiaphas rips his robes and he says, you've all heard it yourselves. What do you now convict him of? Blasphemy. Nobody had to repeat it because they'd all heard it. So now they're all going to vote on it. Jesus is talking about that here. He's reestablishing that principle. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and not a Republican and a publican. <laughs> Look a little bit farther. We find it is also stated over in Acts. Well, we'll just give you the references if you're writing them down because we're running out of time. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. God always uses the multiple witnesses. You shall be witnesses unto me. We find Acts chapter 2 verse 32. We have multiple witnesses to the resurrection as they stand up in on the day of Pentecost and they proclaim the gospel. They have multiple witnesses to the resurrection. We see the same thing in Acts chapter 3 verse 15. Multiple witnesses to the resurrection. Acts chapter 5 verse 32. Again, multiple witnesses to the resurrection. You get the idea. There's a key doctrine in the New Testament. Without the resurrection, there is no hope. Paul makes a big point of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. There are multiple witnesses. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, there were over 500 people that saw him alive, and some of them have died, but the greater part remain unto this day. It was founded on the basis of multiple witnesses. They saw him. They knew it was true. Did Christ rise from the dead? Yes. 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 Was it a real bodily resurrection? 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 Yes. Multiple witnesses. God never leaves himself without a witness. God always has multiple witnesses everywhere you look. Look for a moment over to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Time is moving quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Not 1 Corinthians 13, that's the love chapter. We're talking about witnesses now. 2 Corinthians and chapter 13. Verse 1. This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Here we are back again to Numbers 35, verse 30. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. At is a transdispensational principle. It's always possible that there will be false witnesses. And Jesus prophesies that's going to happen in the last days. And that's how a lot of Christians are going to get killed. But in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. We find it over in the pastoral epistles. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Paul is writing to a young man. We call them pastoral epistles. They, he's actually writing to two young evangelists when he writes to Timothy and Titus. But 1 Timothy chapter 5, and he quotes an Old Testament verse in verse 18 about why pastors should get paid. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the labor is worthy of his reward. And then in verse 19, he's quoting out of Deuteronomy here. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. And Paul tells Timothy, you better make sure you do it right because you've got somebody watching you. There are witnesses to the way that you handle this. Verse 21, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. 
that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing but partiality. He hasn't left the idea of the two or three witnesses. When you do this, if you're going to receive an accusation, you better have two or three witnesses. Why? Because God is watching. The Lord Jesus Christ is watching. The elect angels are watching. So you better be careful that you don't play favorites on this because they know what's going on. Some pretty important witnesses, I would say, in that context. Look at the book of Hebrews. A couple of places in the book of Hebrews. Let's look first at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, and we'll look down at verse 28. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28. Now you know the book of Hebrews was written to Jews. That's why it's named Hebrews. It was written to a particular group of Jews. It was Jewish Christians. Where are they located? Where did the Council of Acts 15 take place? The city of Jerusalem. This is written to Jews after the Council in Jerusalem. This is written as the city of Jerusalem is being surrounded as Romans are invading the land. This just before Titus destroys the city of Jerusalem. And there are five warning passages in the book of Hebrews about how serious it is to renege on your faith. Armenians take those passages to mean loss of salvation. If you read the context, it's loss of rewards and it's chastening, not loss of salvation. But it's rather interesting that it's in that context that twice we find reference to the multiplication of witnesses. We'll start back in verse 26. If we sin willfully, and by the way, what's the willful sin that's listed here for us in the passage? You know the context, the willful sin in the passage is missing church? Ah, I'll start earlier. <laughs> Verse 24. Let us consider one another provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, that is, exhorting one another to assemble, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. And he's been talking about the day that's approaching, going to be a day of judgment. For if we sin willfully, what he'd just been talking about? not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. There are a lot of people who think it's okay to cut church. Dear folks, you ought to be in church every time the doors are open. Every time the word of God is being proclaimed. Every time there's opportunity for fellowship with other believers. Every time there's opportunity for corporate prayer. You should be here because the day is approaching. Why do we have a multi-million dollar complex so that we can sit in here for an hour and 15 minutes on Sunday morning? This morning was an hour and a half. Once a week. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. There's sure a lot less people here tonight than there were this morning. I know I'm preaching to people who can't hear me. For if we sin willfully, that is a willful sin. And when you put anything but God first, you are an idolater. That's serious business. That's what they were dealing with in Acts 15. You see how the principles, the underlying principles, deal with lots of different little individual categories. But you've got principles that underlie every one of those categories. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. You'll discover that there is an underlying principle, and most of those go back to what was laid down in Acts chapter 15. But let me get down to my verse. If we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. That's a bad category to identify with. Now, verse 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. 
He's reminding them of the principle that we're dealing with in the book of Acts, where Paul and Barnabas are now being sent back with two witnesses to say this is what the council at Jerusalem decided. Verse 29. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. Yes, we know that God is going to judge the pagans. Yes, we know God is going to judge the Hitlers and the Stalins and all the other bad leaders in the world and all those guys who are running around committing all those immoral acts and we've got a community full of it. But the thing that should worry us is the Bible says, the Lord shall judge his people. Look at the next verse. Does it not terrify you? It should. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We're dealing with serious issues here, and this issue of two or three witnesses is one of the serious issues, and we find the early church is practicing it because they know it is a principle that God has established to make sure that his word is authenticated and that others who hear it will say, yes, I believe. Heard a story a number of years ago about a missionary who went to a, a tribe and he had the gospel on a tape recorder. And he played it for the natives who were there and it was in whatever the language was that the natives had. And when he had done, the chief said, I want to hear it again. So he played it again. And when he was done, the chief said, I want to hear it again. And he did it four or five times. And finally, the chief turned to his people and said, it must be true. He said it exactly the same every time. <laughs> Not knowing what a tape recorder was. The world is watching us, people. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established. There are people out there who are wondering why Christians don't always say what the Bible says. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Look over to Hebrews chapter 12. We find there's a group of people who said the same thing. Generation after generation, decade after decade, century after century, millennia after millennia. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Witnesses. One final passage. God again, following the principle of one or two or two or three witnesses. Revelation chapter 11. We get all the way down to the last book of the Bible and we find the same principle is established and God holds himself to it. Beginning in verse 1, And there was given unto me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. Verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And this takes us back to prophecies in the book of Zechariah. If any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. And it goes on. It tells you what these two witnesses can do. It's probably Moses and Elijah who are raised specifically for the purpose of being the witnesses here during the tribulation period. We can't prove that definitively, but what does God do? He gives himself two witnesses who have an impeccable testimony 
an impeachable testimony, a powerful testimony that is backed by miraculous signs that kills anybody who tries to come against them. But we discover by the time we get down to chapter 16 in the bold judgments, that even though God has judged the earth with the seal judgment, with the trumpet judgments, with the seal judgments, with the bold judgments, that they will not repent. It says they curse God, they blaspheme God. They refuse to repent. We are to be his witnesses, even if it means that we die as a result of it. Verse 7, when they have finished their testimony, that is, when they have finished their witness, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. We have no question as to what city that was. Spiritually, it has the name of Sodom. Spiritually, it has the name of Egypt. And we've been talking about Pharaoh and Egypt and Pharaoh's resistance to God in our morning messages. God compares Jerusalem at this time to Sodom and to Egypt. And there the two witnesses are killed. And they are the people and kindreds of the tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and in half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put into graves. Let's not even bury those guys. Let them rot. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry. It's going to be party time on earth. They shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood up upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. They still had a witness, didn't they? Of who the true God was. Abel, he being dead, yet speaketh. Dear people, I pray that when we go to be with Christ, that that will be said of us, he being dead, yet speaketh. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the witness that you gave to the early church and the fact that they followed the rule of two or three witnesses. That as Paul and Barnabas went back to Antioch, Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas went with them carrying a written message and confirming the written message with verbal testimony. Father, you have given us a written message and you've told us that we are to confirm it with our verbal testimony as well. Make us faithful to the written word so that we might hold forth the living word. Father, we pray for your blessings on the things that we've studied tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is number 262, Jesus, I am resting.